and presenting Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number 12, Sunday, August 22nd, 2021. The lesson is entitled, Peter and John Preach with Boldness. Lesson text comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 6 through 21. Related scriptures are Acts 3, 1 through chapter 4, verse 5, chapter 5, 23 through 29, Luke 12, 8 through 12, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31, 9, 16 through 18. The place is Jerusalem. The time is 30 AD. You can expect that when God does something great through you, Satan is going to attempt to do something terrible to you. It is a serious mistake to expect the world to applaud you if God is working in your life. If God is actively working in you, Satan is going to be actively working against you. This should not discourage anyone from serving the Lord. Keep in mind that if you do not serve the Lord, Satan is going to be your enemy anyway. The difference is, is that those who love God have his protection with them. The only way to shield yourself from the fiery arrows of the enemy is to go to battle wearing the whole armor of God and trust him to protect you while you serve him. Ephesians 6, 11 through 8. Jesus has already conquered Satan on the cross and has secured our redemption and salvation with his blood. Colossians 1, 14. So there is no need to fear the enemy. Today's aim. Facts. To illustrate that Satan opposes God's people when God is at work through them. Principle, to remember that although the world may come against us for serving Christ, the Lord will always protect us. Application, to learn to trust the Lord to hold us up when the enemy threatens and attacks. Illustrating the lesson. Even if we are surrounded by the enemy, we should never be afraid to speak boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. When we trust in him, the Spirit will empower us to speak for him. Practical points. 1. Christian leaders must value God's plans more than their positions and agendas. Acts 4, 6 through 7. 2. We must learn to rely on the Holy Spirit and speak boldly for God in every opportunity. Verses 8 through 11. 2. To compromise salvation through Jesus alone is to abandon the gospel of Christ, verse 12. 4. God uses ordinary people who believe his word and yield to his power, verses 13 through 14. 5. In spite of all the evidence, many will persist in resisting and rejecting the truth of Jesus, verses 15 through 18. 6. We must be determined never to let threat silence our witness for Christ. Verses 19 through 21. Golden text. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 12. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is stern interrogation coming from Acts 4, 6 through 7. The second is bold proclamation coming from Acts 4, 8 through 12. And the third is frantic damage control, Acts 4, 13 through 21. Introduction. Silence is golden is a truism that nearly everyone has appealed to at one time or another. But silence is manifestly not always golden. When we are silent because we are afraid to speak up about an issue, it is numbing. When we keep quiet because we feel we have nothing to contribute, it is deflating. And worst of all, when we refrain from speaking of the hope of Christ because of subtle peer pressure or an explicit demand to keep our beliefs to ourselves, it is life destroying. From the time when the gospel of Jesus Christ first was sounded, there have always been attempts to silence it. But as long as believers have a true encounter with Jesus and, a and, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, the gospel will continue to go forth despite all opposition. And that sound is golden indeed. Stern Interrogation, Acts 4, 6. And Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, 
And as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem, verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, what, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Our story for this week actually begins one chapter earlier in Acts 3. It was only a short time after Pentecost and the young church was growing. One afternoon, Peter and John went to the temple for the afternoon prayer service, the ninth hour in verse 1 being approximately 3 p.m., where they encountered a man lame from birth begging at the gate called Beautiful, verse 2. Instead of a few coins, Peter gave the beggar what he really needed, wholeness, commanding him in the name of Jesus Christ to stand up and walk. Peter was used by God to demonstrate to all those present the divine power and glory of Jesus' name. If Peter had let things rest with simply healing the man, everything might have proceeded quietly, and that would have been the end of the incident. But God had bigger plans in store. Immediately sensing the opportunity, Peter preached an impromptu message there in the temple courts in which he forthrightly presented the essential truths about Jesus. His divine identity and power, his suffering and his resurrection from the dead, verses 12 through 18. Peter concluded by passionately calling on his hearers to repent and turn to Christ for the cleansing of their sins, verses 19 through 26. <coughs> While Peter was still speaking, the chief priest, captain of the temple guard, and some Sadducees showed up for one, greatly agitated that he presumed to instruct the people about the one they thought they had eliminated. They arrested the two apostles then and there, and since evening was approaching, had them held in jail till morning. Verse 3. The authorities' coercive action, however, could not undo the impact of Peter's words on the gathered multitude. <coughs> Acts 4.4 4 reports that many there believed, bringing the total number of believers in Christ to about 5,000 men and much more than that with women and children counted. The next morning, the Jewish council of Sanhedrin assembled the rulers and elders and scribes, verse 5. Our lesson text opens with the big guns brought in against the apostles, the high priest Annas, along with a number of his relatives, <coughs> Caiaphas, John, <coughs> and Alexander, plus many not named. It was an assembly of the powerful and no doubt meant to intimidate. All these prominent names gathered to deal with two upstart fishermen from Galilee who now were causing an uncomfortable stir. Once the apostles were brought in, the authorities wasted no time in small talk. They wanted to know on whose authority or by what name Peter and John had done all this, verse 7. By this, they were referring specifically to the healing of the lame man, but they, but they may also have had in mind Peter's sermon and his dramatic effect on the people. The leaders were not happy with the way things were going, and they made their displeasure clear in the wording of their question. Bold proclamation, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, verse 9, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? Verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand be here before you whole. Verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. A forthright answer. Acts 4, 8 through 10. If the council hoped that the interrogation might intimidate the apostles, they were quickly disappointed. 
Far from being cowed, Peter took the question as the opportunity he needed to further proclaim Christ in this public arena. It is important to observe, however, that Peter's boldness did not come from himself. The author Luke carefully notes that he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Everything that follows rested on that vital reality. Respectfully addressing his questioners, his questioners as the leaders and elders of the nation, Peter first noted the irony that he and John were being interrogated because of an act of kindness shown to a crippled man. But the elders' question served as the open invitation for Peter to say what he most wanted to say all along. He was going to make it known to them and to all the people of Israel, verse 10. It was almost as if he were saying, you asked for it, so here it is. We can practically hear the relish in his voice. Peter, the man who not that long before had denied knowing Christ, did not mince words now. The once lame man had been made whole by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It was on his authority alone that Peter had acted and by his power that the man was healed. That statement alone would have been sufficient to rile the council members, but Peter added more. He pointedly reminded them that they had crucified this Jesus, but that God had raised him from the dead. Jesus' resurrection was certainly the last thing these leaders wanted to hear about, for it undid all they had hoped to accomplish in having him crucified. They had sent Jesus to the cross with the aim of silencing his teaching and ending his influence on the people, which they regarded as baleful and dangerous. Now this influence and, and the following it inspired were staring to life before their eyes with frightening and disturbing power. They worked in vain to keep a lid on it. A sweeping challenge. Acts 4, 11 through 12. The authorities might have felt they had heard enough already, but Peter was not finished. He proceeded to give them a lesson in the proper interpretation of their own scriptures. Citing Psalms 118.22, Peter identified Jesus as the stone that the builders, Israel's leaders, seated before him had rejected. What they rejected, however, had become the, key, the chief cornerstone of the building, and this by God's intervention, verse 23. It was a galling truth for the leaders to face. What must have made it especially troubling for them was that this was not the first time they had been confronted by this teaching. In a contentious exchange with the chief priests and Pharisees, Jesus had quoted the passage at greater length and made clear that his opponents were about to stumble over the rejected stone and be crushed by it, Matthew 21, 42 through 44. The kingdom would be taken away from them and given to others. Moreover, they had understood his rebuke then, verse 45. So Peter's words now must have brought the unwelcome memory roiling back to full force. But the apostle still was not finished. The religious leaders conceivably might concede Peter's point and grant that Jesus was an important teacher, a source of enlightenment and hope for many, but not for them. If the common people wanted to look to the Galilean for healing and comfort, so be it. The authorities might not be able to prevent it, but the rabbi from Nazareth was not someone they were going to look to for spiritual insight, much less follow as disciples. To prevent any such hedging and more important, to clearly define the spiritual stakes for everyone, Peter made a declaration of undiluted exclusivity, making neither is their salvation neither is their salvation in any other Acts 4:12. If the religious leaders, if anybody rejected or ignored Jesus, they would be on the outside, removed from God's favor, blessing, and peace. Eternal life would be far from them. Two men who considered themselves the arbiters of spiritual life and blessings, this was a challenge as great as any Jesus had personally confronted them with during his ministry. But Peter still had more to say. Building on his declaration, he explained that God had not given mankind any other name by which they could be saved. 
Only the name of Jesus, the authority of God's anointed one, could bring the spiritual life and wholeness that every person on earth needs, including those presuming to sit in judgment over Peter and John. In just a few short sentences, Peter had moved from answering by what name he had healed a lame man to proclaiming the only name by which his interrogators could find salvation for themselves. He turned his questioner's challenge into a challenge of his own with eternal implications. Frantic damage control. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Verse 14. And beholding the men which was healed standing with them, they could not say nothing against it. Verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. Verse 16. Saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle have been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Verse 17. But that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Verse 20, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Verse 21, so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Astonished consternation, Acts 4, 13-14. The religious leaders were now prepared to take seriously the claims of Christ, much less seek salvation from him. But they nevertheless were amazed by what they had just heard, no doubt expecting these two unlearned and ignorant Galileans to be suitably awed by the formidable assembly of elders and officials. They instead took note of the boldness displayed by Peter and John and Marvel, verse 16. The eminent leaders were the ones in awe. The authorities immediately recognized, took knowledge of, Peter and John as men who had been with Jesus. That association was now a badge of honor to the apostles, but it was a source of consternation for the authorities. A further problem for the leaders was the presence of the healed beggar right before them. All Jerusalem knew this man from his years of sitting at the temple gate. Everyone knew he had been lame from birth, and here he was standing tall and strong. The authorities could not say nothing in contradiction. They could not claim the healing was a hoax. It was too obvious. They could not Say another person had been substituted, the lame man was too well known. So as verse 14 reports, they had nothing to say. A desperate plan, Acts 4, 15 through 18. The leaders had no option but to send Peter and John out of the chamber. They needed time to confer privately among themselves. Their palatable dilemma is humorous in retrospect. What shall we do to these men? Verse 15. They were in a quandary over that question, for they knew the apostles had performed an exceptional miracle, one that by now everyone in Jerusalem knew about. On the other hand, they did not want the news of the incident to spread, especially since it was news that would carry and promote the name of Jesus. What their options, with their options limited, they came up with the only plan they could think of. They would warn the apostles in the strongest terms not to speak to anyone in the name of Jesus from that time forward. After the speech they had just heard from Peter, they may well have struck even them as a laughable, empty threat. Not having any better plan, the council called Peter and John back in, ordered them not to speak or teach any more in the name of Jesus. They could believe in him if they wanted, but they were to keep it to themselves. A polite but firm refusal. Acts 4, 19-20. Not surprisingly, Peter and John could not agree to the council's demand. Peter phrased the issue as a question for his questioners to weigh. 
whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, verse 19. To emphasize the point, Peter added, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard, verse 20. They had been witnesses to the most monumentous event in human history since the fall, and to expect them to keep quiet about it was beyond any rational consideration. Prophets had vainly tried to bottle up God's word in the past, Jeremiah 29. It was not going to work with the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise of the new life in him. Preventing a sunrise would have been easier. An impotent threat, Acts 4.21. The council had no good answer to Peter's challenge and they knew it. The best they could come up with was to threaten them once more about speaking in the name of Jesus and then let them go. They could not resort to meaningful punishment for fear of starting a riot. They knew that people everywhere in the city were praising God for the spectacular healing of the lame man. It was the same problem the leaders had accounted with Jesus, Matthew 26, 4 through 5, and it must have frustrated them greatly. The sad tragedy, however, is that it did not spur them to examine their own hearts and seek Jesus for themselves. Questions. 1. What did the authorities demand to know from Peter and John? 2. Where did Peter get his boldness to answer? 3. How did Peter answer the council's question? 4. What passage did Peter cite in reminding the council of Jesus' authority? 5. How did Peter make clear that Jesus was the only way to salvation for everyone? 6. Why were the religious leaders in awe of what they heard? 7. How did the presence of the lame man complicate things for them? 8. What did the council demand that Peter and John do? 9. How did the apostles respond to this demand? 10. Why was the council unable to come up with anything stronger than an empty threat? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, August 22, 2021. Thank you for listening. God bless.